there's something about the sea, its rhythmic waves of blue and seemingly endless horizon of mystery that beckons one to venture further into her depths. Down through time and antiquity, the siren call of the sea has hypnotically transfixed the eyes of many a man and caused them to sail out far beyond their modest intentions, only to find the fickle demeanor of the once placid ocean suddenly change, change into a rolling, raging tempest whose sole purpose is to swallow a vessel into a cold abyss. With today's technology, a naval ship is able to steer clear of an approaching storm by radar signal and global positioning navigation. And even if the squall comes apparently from out of nowhere, with radio and satellite communications, no crew of sailors is actually ever alone. Enormous helicopters and high-speed rescue boats can be sent to a precise location to snatch the helpless from a watery grave. But that's not always been the case. Over 250 years ago, wooden boats powered by canvas sails tried the seas with no assurance that they would ever set foot on solid ground again. Out on the ocean in those days, the experienced captain had no more warning of an oncoming gale than a few cloud wisps in the sky or a reddish tint at sunrise. And when it came in a violent rage, the cries for help from terrified seamen were drowned out by the crashing waves and deafening thunder that roared into the darkness of the night. On land, one could run to a cave or a cellar and hide until the storm passes. But on a boat in the open seas, there is no place to run, no refuge to find. There's no hold fast to find security to weather the storm, no footing on which to make a stand against the winds and the waves. It is here, when mortal men are at the mercy of the tempestuous waters, that they do what sailors have done since the days of Jonah. They cry out to God. Such was the instance with a sailor named John. Both the captain and the crew of the Greyhound never recall a more horrifying and seemingly endless storm than that encountered in March of 1748. The pounding waves had shattered some of the ship's outer hull, causing the vessel to take on water and fast. One sailor had already been washed off the deck into the depths, never to be seen again. In that frantic moment, John hesitated to cry out for heaven's help. How humiliating to call out to God now that he was in such a desperate hour. And to call upon God after he had forsaken him so long ago for a life abandoned to wickedness and rebellion which knew no limits. That was undoubtedly a prayer that would fall upon a divinely deaf ear. But cry John did, and the Lord heard that cry and reached down with a tender hand of love and grace and not only saved John from the storm, but rescued his life from the depths of sin. This rescue proved to be a moment that would eventually impact much of the known world for centuries to come. This is Wretched John, and I'm Ronnie Brown. The story of our sailor unfolds in the small seaport district of Wapping on the River Thames, just east of London. In the early 18th century, it was a dirty yet bustling community of sailors, dockhands, sailmakers, and boat builders. An appropriate place for a shipmaster's son to be born. John, who was named after his father, was born on July the 24th, 1725. Although John Sr.'s wife, Elizabeth, the only daughter of Simon Scatliffe, an instrument maker from London, was barely outside of her teenage years when she gave birth to John, she would prove to be an exemplary mother. With his seagoing father absent for better part of a year each time he set sail for the Mediterranean trading routes, much of the early childhood instruction of John was undertaken by Elizabeth. She was well-educated for her time, 
as well as having a deep devotion for the faith which was entrenched in her at an early age through her Puritan upbringing. She regularly attended worship at the old Gravel Lane Independent Meeting House in Wapping, a dissenting congregation pastored by Dr. David Jennings. Elizabeth dedicated herself to the Christian education of her son. From his earliest days, she would teach him from the scriptures, insisting that he memorize both extended passages and hymns of worship. While other children played and ran in the streets in the seaport village, John would be found with his book spread out on a table and his mother at his side guiding him. Writing of his mother later in life, John added, quote, Almost her whole employment was the care of my education, end quote. Because of this, by a very young age, John developed a strong understanding of a wide range of topics as well as a unique ability to memorize long written passages by heart. Elizabeth's hurried pace in educating her son could be attributed to her progressively failing health. Her symptoms of chest pain, shortness of breath, chronic fatigue, and a cough mixed with blood could only mean one diagnosis, tuberculosis, a dreaded and incurable disease of that age. So for her, time was of the essence. Her heart's desire was that her bright young boy might one day become a Christian minister. By the spring of 1732, Elizabeth's health was deteriorating rapidly. In hopes that she might make a turnaround, Elizabeth and her young son John went to stay with the Catlett family, home of her cousin and close friend also named Elizabeth, at Chatham in the county of Kent along the southeast coast of England. It was believed that breathing in sea air would bring relief to the symptoms of her debilitating ailment. While this was a happy reunion with her cousin Elizabeth and her newborn daughter Mary, this joy was short-lived. The coastal environment did not have the desired effect upon the condition of John's mother, and just a few months after arriving, Elizabeth died. John, who was just a few weeks from his seventh birthday, was not at her side thought to be too young to see his mother suffer from such a devastating illness, John was living with family and friends in London when he received the news that his mother had died. When John's father returned from sea in the early months of 1733, he spent little time in mourning, remarrying quickly to the daughter of a wealthy grazier in Essex. This new marriage produced two sons and a daughter in quick succession, forcing John into the role of of an excluded stepson. From the age of seven to ten, John was sent off to boarding schools where he was treated harshly by schoolmasters, and when he came home in the interim, he was mostly excluded from the inner circle of the family. Later writing, quote, My father left me much to run about in the streets, yet when under his eye he kept me at a great distance, end quote. Even though John's relationship with his father was very formal and cold, they both shared a common love for the sea. As a small boy, John was thrilled to see the ships come in and out of the Pool of London. It was also a special treat for him to be taken aboard his father's ship when it was in port. With this in mind, and hoping to steer the boy into a family vocation, his father thought it best to take his son with him to sea withdrawing him from school at the age of 10, thus ending John's formal education. It was in 1736 that John made his first voyage with his father to Spain. Over the following years, John made several Mediterranean voyages, but these protracted times together were not moments of bonding for this father and son. John Sr. was very formal and detached when it came to his son. His severity discouraged John, who was always in a state, quote, of fear and bondage, end quote, in his presence. On these voyages, John was under the watchful eye of his father, bunking with him in the captain's quarters. 
But young John could not be with his father every moment and was naturally exposed to the coarse and blasphemous behavior of the average 18th century deckhand. With each successive voyage with his father during those teenage years, the biblical instruction of his mother faded from memory as he ventured deeper into a careless and sinful manner of life. This was not without the occasional jolt of conscience. When John was 12, he had a fall from a horse while riding in the English countryside. Upon regaining his footing, he realized that his fall was only a matter of inches from a sharp spike protruding from a hedgerow. The narrow miss caused him a short-lived reformation of his sinful activities. But it was not long before he returned to what he called, quote, profane practices, end quote, and, quote, greater depths of wickedness, end quote. On another later occasion, John was to meet a friend to tour a Navy battleship, what was called a man-of-war, anchored in Purfleet just outside of London. His fury at watching the longboat already rowing toward the battleship with his companion in it suddenly turned to horror when the boat struck an underwater object. The boat sank, drowning several on board, including his friend. John was devastated by the loss of his friend and sobered by the reality that he would have met the same fate were it not for a providential delay in his arrival. At the funeral, he was moved to take serious the religion of his childhood and thereafter settled into a religious self-denial with regular fastings, meditation, prayer, and rigorous Bible readings. But again, after a couple of years, such rigid exercises became empty and pointless. Of this period, John wrote, quote, It was a poor religion. It left me in many respects under the power of sin, and, so far as it prevailed, only tended to make me gloomy, stupid, unsociable, and useless, end quote. By this point, in his late teens, he was living a duplicitous life, one moment attending to religious disciplines and the next indulging in sensuous vice and wicked conduct. John wrote, quote, All this while, my heart was insincere. I often saw the necessity of religion as a means of escaping hell, but I loved sin and was unwilling to forsake it, end quote. It was during this time that John acquired a book while in Middleborough in Holland, which drastically impacted his life. The book was entitled, quote, Characteristics of Men, Manners, Opinions, Times, end quote, by Anthony Ashley Cooper, 3rd Earl of Shaftesbury in 1711. Shaftesbury was a deist and a clever writer. Page by page, the book's discourse undermined any Christian underpinning John's mother tried to instill in his early life and unleashed him from any apprehension he may have had towards sinful indulgence. John later wrote that the book, quote, operated like a slow poison, end quote, preparing the way for the depths of wickedness he would pursue. By his late teens, with the influence of this book and the experience of several Mediterranean voyages, John had picked up every sinful and immoral habit for which sailors were known. John's father, recognizing his son's degrading behavior and his brooding and moody idleness, not to mention his lack of aptitude when it came to sailing, made plans through his employer, a wealthy merchant named Joseph Manisty, for his son to have a new career. John would travel to Jamaica where he would be trained as a manager on one of Manistee's sugar plantations. This would be a prosperous opportunity in that once he learned how to manage the slave workers and how to bring in and process the sugar harvest, he would be in the lucrative position of owning his own plantation. Initially, John was enthusiastic about these plans, yet that excitement was interrupted, not by another near-death experience, but by the similarly startling circumstance of falling in love.
The plan was for John to sail from Liverpool in the month of December of 1742. Now, at that time, there was a coach from London to Warrington once a week. He was to catch the coach to Warrington, then finish his journey to Liverpool on foot. However, just a few weeks before leaving, he received a letter from Elizabeth Catlett, the cousin and close friend of John's mother that tended to her in those final days. Over the past 10 years, tension had developed between these two families. This may have taken place because of the sudden remarriage of John's father once he returned and found his wife dead. Whatever the reason, the two families had not been on speaking terms for many years. The letter sent to John evidenced that perhaps time had healed these old wounds. For the note was an invitation from Elizabeth asking him to come pay a call on the Catlett home in Kent whenever convenient. By providential arrangement, when John received this letter, he already had plans in place to travel to Maidstone in Kent on a matter of business. After a discussion with his father, John was given permission to visit the Catlets upon his return from Maidstone. This visit quite nearly didn't happen because John was anxious to return home after such a long business trip and was honestly uninterested in meeting people he had not seen since he was quite young. But for whatever reason, maybe it was the cold December winds. Maybe it was because he found himself within a half mile from their house. John changed his mind and made his way to the Catlett home. This was a decision that would change the direction of his life, for as the door of the relative's home opened, he was overwhelmed with love at first sight. The eldest daughter of the family, Mary, also called Polly, had answered the door upon John's knock. He was smitten with her beauty and fell instantly in love with her, writing, quote, Almost at the first sight of this girl, I felt an affection for her which never abated, end quote. But sadly, that love would have to be stayed bottled up within his breast because Polly was only 13 years old at the time. So as he spent a friendly and enjoyable stay with the Catliff family, he contemplated his future. Days went by, and he prolonged his stay, never telling the Catlets about the coach to Warrington. He missed the coach, thinking that he could take the next one and still catch the ship to Jamaica. But after two weeks, he realized that it would be impossible for him to be at that great a distance from his love and determined that his father's anger was a small price to pay when compared to being separated from Polly for five or more years. Staying a full three weeks to ensure the ship to Jamaica was gone, he made his way home to bear the brunt of his father's wrath. John Sr. was furious. Not only had his impetuous son disobeyed him, but he had also spoiled the well-laid and promising plans made for him. Not to mention the frustration and disappointment the boy had caused Joseph Manistee, John Sr.'s wealthy and powerful employer. But his anger subsided in a few days, despite not being able to understand why John would forgo such a great opportunity, for the young man did not mention his deep affection for the Catlett daughter. In time, John Sr. forgave his son for his foolish decision. Thinking that there may be a chance that the boy might yet make a sailor and join his father in the family business, he sent him out to sea once again, this time on his own. John Sr. arranged that the young man would sail under the command of a close friend. This would be a chance to prove himself without his father, and at the same time, he would no longer have the security of being the captain's son. But the voyage further hardened and coarsened John. Without a parental eye under him, he began to take on the character of a common sailor, drinking more and more and blaspheming with unthinking regularity. He wrote, quote, I did not indeed as yet turn out profligate, 
but I was making large strides toward a total apostasy from God, end quote. Upon his arrival home late in 1743, his mind was focused on one thing, seeing again the girl of his dreams, Polly. Arriving at the Catlin home, he was a welcome guest, and once again he prolonged his stay and missed yet another career opportunity arranged by his father. This time, it was an appointment which could have led to an officer's posting on a merchant ship. Even though his father was on the verge of disowning him, John was intoxicated with the presence of Polly. But with no wealth, nor career prospects, he could not possibly pursue marriage. He was in a quandary as to what course to take. While contemplating his dilemma on a walk through the English countryside, John's life took another drastic turn. He was press-ganged into the Royal Navy. At this time, England was on the verge of war with France, and naval ships drastically undermanned were allowed to send groups of sailors into the seaport countryside to seize unsuspecting men who looked to have naval experience, impressing them into the king's navy. For this group of sailors, John was a great catch, and it wasn't long before he found himself on board His Majesty's ship, the Harwich. John's story will continue with our next episode. Wretched John is a Forgotten Podcast special series and an Unseen Hand media production written and produced by me, Ronnie Brown. You can find out more about this show at ForgottenPodcast.com. I'm also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Forgotten Podcast. Forgotten is available on all the most popular podcasting apps, so be sure to subscribe. Also, please stop in and leave a rating and review on iTunes. Lastly, this podcast would not be possible without an ever-growing group of generous supporters. To find out how you can support the Forgotten Podcast, just go to ForgottenPodcast.com support. And as always, thanks for listening.